Good evening, friends and young people. Indeed, our um, indeed our hearts have been stopped this last week with the events in the Ukraine, and we ask the question: Russia, can it be stopped? And we don't know the outcome of the present war that's taking place, but we know from Bible and prophecy what will take place at the end and the fulfillment of it. So we don't know in detail. So tonight we want to look at what is happening, and then we want to look at some Bible prophecy to encourage us and help us in these difficult times. We'll just uh, have our minds on these pictures for a few moments. I know you share with me great sadness as you look at these pictures and you think about the events that are taking place in the Ukraine and the concern that we have of the people there. And the message we have today and the, the prophecy that we are looking at, many here have heard many, many times. And there's some of you may be hearing for the first time. So what we hope to see is these events are leading to the return of Christ. As in the apostles days, so in our days, there is a sense of urgency when we read through the message. And we stop and think for a minute that there's no greater urgency than for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine that fear for their lives. How they hold on to this message of hope, how they hold on and in prayer and seek their father and look for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet you and I will go home to a comfortable and warm home with no fears of, of not waking up the next morning because we're in a war zone. And I think it's so important that as we look at this tonight, we reflect upon ourselves and where we are and where we wanna be. A few points before we begin. We are deeply saddened by the pain and suffering that is taking place in the Ukraine. We are not involved in politics or have political interest in these events whatsoever. We are concerned with what God has foretold in his word that will come to pass. Now, it's interesting when we look at the area of the Ukraine, going back to the mid 11th century, 
Here we have, uh, it was called, well, the capital, well, the area was called Kivan Ras. And we see where Kiev, where, where that is on the bottom there. And it was the time the Byzantine Empire was still there under Constantinople. So the capital of Kiev, Rus, was Kiev on the Nifer River. The name Kievan Rus refers both to the state and its people. Kievan Rus was sometimes trading partners and other times enemy of the Byzantine Empire. But we see that the conversion of this people in 987, Prince Vladimir I of Kievan, ruler over the Kievan Rus, formed an alliance with the Byzantine Empire, Basil II, converting from paganism to Christianity and marrying Basil II's sister, Anna, in 988. Historical texts describe the subsequent conversion of Vladimir, formerly pagan, subjects by mass baptism everyone was everyone from this city in the region were was baptized in the river in kiev so we see a map mass baptism and all these people were converted to christianity and we see that in doing so they adopted not only the religion but the architecture of constantinople and here we have uh, the, it's called, uh, well, anyways, it's a Sophie Mosque in Kiev, but it was similar to the one in Constantinople. So we see here, we're looking at here at the roots of the Ukraine. And from this, we see the rise of Moscow referred to as the Third Rome. In the middle of the 13th century, Kiev fell to Mongol, Mongol invaders. Moscow emerged in the 12th century, gaining wealth and power in the 14th and 15th centuries. As Moscow ascended, the Byzantine Empire declined. In 1453, it fell to the Ottomans. In the years to follow, Moscow increasingly viewed itself as a successor to Byzantine, referring to itself as the Third Rome. So we see here how not only the Ukraine, but also Moscow took on the, the Christian um, beliefs and Moscow took on the role of Constant, Constantinople. And it's interesting that Putin attaches significance to Kievan Rus. Uh, a, a copy of, the, of this statue was put in Moscow. I don't know if, I'm sorry, I missed putting the statue in. Okay, I apologize for that. So uh, in Kievan, they have a uh, monument with a, with a statue like this man here on the very top. So what Putin did is he took a copy of it from K Kiev and um, he put it in Moscow. And actually, if you look carefully at the lower right, you can actually see Putin giving an address to uh, for this statue. The timing of the Moscow installation of the new statue of Prince Vladimir in 2016 was also significant. It coincided with Russia's recent annexation of Crimea and ongoing armed conflict with Ukraine. So we see here that this is, we see today a continuation of actually what started back then. Putin's mindset is he, he claims, his claim to Christianity is uh, by installing the new statue of Prince Vladimir in his capital, Russia seems to lay claim to the historical legacy and perhaps even the former territories of Kievan Rus. 
even while some of those territories are part of other states, such as Ukraine. Putin also claims that he was secretly baptized as a young child by his mother. Putin today claims he is the defender of Christianity. And he, he holds that from the work that he's done, getting rid of ISIS and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's, his, that's what he's claiming anyways. So here we have uh, a quote from July 12th, 2021. Russians, Ukraines, and Be Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rush, which was the largest state in Europe. I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. So what we see today is something that Putin has been working on for quite some time in his mind anyways. And what we'd like to do is to turn to the word of God. Does the Bible speak about Russia and their final outcome? Can we have hope in this, de in this desperate outcome of war? How can we achieve this hope? So those are the questions that we would like to answer. And tonight we had read for us Ezekiel 38. And the author is writing while he is in captivity in Babylon in 605 BC and is writing to the Jews in captivity. But what is really interesting, although it was written so long ago, the time period that Ezekiel is prophesying about is the days in which we live in. And verse 8 gives of Ezekiel 38 uh, tells us that. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years that shall, come, that shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So we see here that the focus of this prophecy is at a time when the Jewish people have returned to the land of Israel. They have ended a, a time of 2,000 years in which they were spread throughout the nations of Europe and round about, and now they've come back to the land. So this is the time period that Ezekiel is talking about. So Ezekiel 38 starts out with a judgment against the nations. And it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So here we see uh, a list of names, uh, names that we're not familiar with, but there were names that Ezekiel was familiar with for the nations at his time. So we see Gog and Magog, Meshach and Tubal. And what's interesting is um, what I've got up right now is the King James Version and many of the other versions uh, changed the word prince to rosh, a uh, chief to rosh, sorry. I'll give you an example. The new King James, son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So we see here laid out for us that instead of the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, they have the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So these are three areas in which uh, are in the land of Magog, in which Gog is uh, ruling over. So 
the first question we have to ask is, is where is this? And how, how do we know exactly what these places are? Well, Josephus, who was a historian, just after the time of Christ, from AD 37 to 100, said Magog founded those that were from him named Maganites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. And then Herodotus, and, and I find this quite interesting because Herodotus, he lived from 464 BC to 424 BC. So he's about 150 years after Ezekiel. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a fair time ago. And he likewise refers to them as the Scythia, the western border, the river Danube, eastern border, the river Don. And it's a little easier to see it on this map. So here we see the border and that they're talking about. And they're saying these are the ancient names for the people that lived in between these two rivers. So Herodotus also, uh, this is a map that uh, I'm assuming he made, the world according to Herodotus, BC 450. And actually I find it very hard to fathom that back then they were able to make a map like this. Um, and it is, uh, when you, when you consider uh, what's on it, it, it's fairly detailed. So we have here Scythia, the area above the Black Sea. And then we have um, Syria, and then Assyria, uh, per Persis, which is Persia, which is Iran today, Arabia, Libya, Ethiopia, so we see here, it's quite detailed. In fact, it's so detailed that we see from the River Nile, we see drawn out someone who took a boat and went down and around Africa and came back into the Red Sea. And it's laid out and who, who actually uh, took a boat and did that. And I thought, well, that's, <laughs> that's really remarkable. So, now uh, laying out the, uh, the cities, not the cities, but the areas on the map. Now we have to remember that we don't have, we, we, we've got a general idea of where they are. We don't have explicitly in detail the exact location. And to be honest with you, that's why I decided to use this map than a, than a, a, a map proper of, of how we know a map because then it, you're really splitting hairs of trying to decide where things go. So we have Magog, we have Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So Gog of the land of Magog was also chief of Rosh. So, he, so we see Gog was the ruler of the land of Magog, but he was also over Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. We see Tarshish, it represented the Br British Commonwealth. Um, it represents the area of, of Britain. The British Commonwealth back then did not exist. I'm pretty sure I'm safe in saying that. If anybody disagrees, they can speak to me afterwards. Um, so then we see Togomer, which is around Turkey. Persia, Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia. Now, what's interesting is all the areas in red are what Ezekiel 38 is referring to as the nations that come down with him to, uh, to, to come to the land of Israel. And we'll look at that a little closer. So we see them laid out on the map. And we see Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish. Uh, and we'll see that as these nations come down, they say, 
have you come to take a spoil? Like, what are you doing here? It's almost like today in which Russia has gone into, to, um, I keep wanting to say Crimea instead of uh, Ukraine. I don't know why I have this block, but I do. <laughs> it's on my shoulders. Um, but anyways, so we see that the nations round about, the Western nations are sort of questioning, well, what are you doing? And like, they are terrified to put their own armies in because it would bring about a world war and it would end up being nuclear weapons out and everything else. So it's, it's an interesting scenario. So Prince of Rosh, uh, is the modern name for Russia. It comes from the Byzantine Greek, Rosia, which is to derive from Rus. And we actually, when we saw that slide back in the 11th century of Kiev, Rus, we see that uh, it was the name of the place and the name of the people, which was quite interesting. Um, we suggest Meshach uh, may be in the Moscow area and then Tubal is another area in Russia. So when you think of Russia and you think of all these nations that we've looked at that are going to come down upon Israel, maybe it's easier to look at it this way. And we think we're, we're told that he will come from the north. Well, look at all the areas in which Russia is. And you go north, and Russia, Russia's in the whole area. So who, who else can it be? It, it, it's, it's as simple as that. So we see in Ezekiel 38, verses 9 to 13. I'm sorry, verses 4 to 7. And we'll, we'll turn to that. I'm going to have to watch the clock here, too. Ezekiel 38, verses 4 to 7. And I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thy army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomer of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, prepare for thyself and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. In verse 8, we've already read about, and after many days, Thou shalt be visited in the latter years. And it talks of them coming up to the mountains of Israel. So we see here clearly laid out Russia and many people with him shall come down upon the nations. Uh, Ezekiel 38 verses 9 to 13. And uh, we had it read for us, so we're not going to um, go and read it again. But I'll just go through some highlights we're told that they shall come like a storm, like a cloud to cover the land. We're told they'll go up to a land of unwalled villages. Them that are at rest, they're, they're living confidently to take a spoil. So who are these people but those in in? Israel, and we saw that in verse 8. And we see Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with her, and the young lions shall say, Aren't you come to take a spoil? Well, just, just to get our minds thinking for a moment, and uh, this is by no means uh, suggesting that this is absolutely the way it's going to happen, but it's interesting that if all these sanctions work upon Russia, like the West is hoping, Russia is going to be broke. And they're going to need a spoil to finance themselves. It was interesting, I was reading that Ukraine actually in the Black Sea has 
tons of oil. And that's another reason why Russia wants the area. Because so it, it's interesting. We, we don't know the details, but our Heavenly Father has given us what will happen as far as the big picture goes. And sometimes it's best not to let our minds think too much and then be disappointed it didn't work out the way we thought. But we, we know that our Heavenly Father is in control. So Ezekiel 38, uh, verses 15 to 16, it says, And thou shalt come out of thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I'll bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, and when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before thy eyes. So what's really interesting is, is we're showed here the purpose of these nations coming down and what God's going to do to them is to show that he is God and he will be sanctified by these things. That is, that is the purpose in verses 22 and 23, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. Well, many nations do not have a clue who God is, but yet they shall come to know God by the judgments he's brought upon these nations. We also read this in Ezekiel 39, verses 4 to 7. And thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bound bands, and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto ravenous birds of every sort, and to beasts, and to the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, said the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So we see over and over again the emphasis on God being declared the Holy One. So just stopping for a moment, what do we see in Israel today? Well, the Abraham Accords are sowing seeds of peace, harvesting fruits of prosperity, this article uh, says. Um, as recently as February the 2nd, Israel participated in a naval exercise that included Saudi Arabia. This would have been inconceivable even a few years ago. In November, Israel and the Emirate state state-owned defense companies signed a deal to jointly develop a semi to auto, uh, sorry semi to fully autonomous navy via, I'm getting tongue tied navy vessels to combat the Iranian anti-ship mines at sea so we see here a, a lot is taking place in Israel right now. They're, they're, they're very prosperous. They're getting large contracts with the nations that they've made agreements through. Um, we can see uh, they don't have full peace, but we see how they are working with the Arabs and developing um, an incredible relationship. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, so just recently, um, Russia slams Israel occupation of Golan Heights after Jerusalem supports Ukraine. So here we have Jerusalem is uh, Israel has said 
Russia it really shouldn't be going in. So they've reversed their position on the Golan Heights and saying they belong to Syria. Russia takes issue with Israel's sovereignty over Golan Heights and Jerusalem, and that's uh, February the 24th. What's interesting is just, just recently, um, we see here uh, in the Mediterranean, a Russian Navy formation of all these ships in formation going into the Syria base. So uh, it's to help them with Ukraine, but it also they're showing an extremely large military presence. And we must recognize that is, uh, Russia is already at the border of Israel with a large base in Syria. We'd just like to close by looking at these verses here. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 4. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the south, and half toward the south. So here we see a, a great destruction by the nations, and it talks about the Lord going forth. And we see, actually, we see the Lord Jesus Christ returning, and as, as it was prophesied in the New Testament, that his feet, he would come back to the Mount of Olives. And we see the mountains split, and we see the, the defeat of the nations round about. Verse 9 of this chapter, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord, and his name one. So we see here, as we struggle with the events today in I was going to keep wanting to say Crimea, in Ukraine. We struggle with the events that are taking place in the uh, Ukraine. We see how it is prophesied the destruction of God, Gog, and the nations with this ruler to declare that the God of Israel and to set up a king, the Lord Jesus Christ, to reign on the earth. And at this point, we'll call upon uh, Levi, and he is going to speak to us on um, what, we, what, we, what, sh what we should do uh, with knowing these, uh, these events. Thank you. My entire life, I've grown up reading the Bible and learning from the Bible. I had a family who did the Bible readings. Um, I went to Sunday school, and I did my own personal Bible study. And I attended talks similar to this one. And I've learned many things, and I'm continuing to learn, and I'm in that process of of seeking to learn more about the Bible. But as I've learned, I've come to be fascinated by Bible prophecy. There are many Bible prophecies that exist. And there's one that stood out in particular. And that Bible prophecy that stood out in particular is the prophecy of Israel. 
You see, the Bible predicts, or predicted, I should say, that the Jews would be a totally scattered nation. They would, they would scatter across the whole entire world, and they would be left with no real nation. But the Bible also predicted that they would be gathered again back into the land of Israel to once again become an official nation. And this actually happened. It came to pass. In 1948, Israel became a nation. And many Bible students and theologists before this came to pass in 1948 had said, this is going to happen. And particularly, we as Christadelphians were very strong on this. We very much believed that Israel would become a nation that was back in the land. And at the time, it seemed impossible. They were scattered. They weren't the way they are now. And that process is still actually continuing of these Jews continuing to come back to the land. But now they're this nation. And that's a verifiable fact, a prophecy that we can go back and look and see writings and um, uh, theologies where people have written that they expected that Israel would return to their land. Um, and really, the Bible is where we can read that that was predicted, right? The Bible says it. It's very clear and very plain, and there's verses that show that. But now we can verify it with fact. 1948, Israel's back in the land. So I've grown up with this evidence of the Bible's accuracy. And that's something that is so impactful because we can look and we can see and we can feel that certainty. Not that we should be 100% confident when it comes to our interpretations of Bible prophecy because there is room for human error. We're not here to be dogmatic and say with Russia, for example, this is exactly how it's going to go. But there are some prophecies that are more clear than others. And so for my whole life, I've heard these different prophecies. And one of the other prophecies that I've heard come up time and time again is this prophecy that we've just looked at in Ezekiel 38. That prophecy that Russia will overpower Europe on its way down towards Israel to invade and to take a spoil. And so these prophecies, when we see movements like this on the political stage, they can be very confirming of our faith. Not that we need this confirmation, because we, we have faith regardless, but it's prophecies like these that can strengthen and encourage our faith. The Bible predicted this whole sequence of events that happened in Israel, and that fulfillment continues today, and we continue to see it as the Jews continue to, to return to the land. But turning our focus to the prophecy that we've just looked at tonight, and those images we saw at the beginning of the harsh and sick realities of war is terrifying. It, it hurts to even watch, let alone be one of those people. I can't even imagine trying to step into the shoes of a wife who has to leave her husband, who will get thrown in jail if he wants to stay with her and not go to war. So it's, it's unimaginable what I'm unimaginable what these people are going through. And when we look at war, all we see is pain, suffering, death, murder, seemingly no hope and no peace. But what we know from Scripture is this is the world in its current state. And this is the world before Christ returns and, and shortly before Christ returns. 
Matthew 24 and verse 6 to 7 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. This has to happen, essentially is what that's saying. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famine and earthquakes in various places. So before Christ comes back, the world is filled with suffering. It's filled with these, these things that aren't nice to watch. And even more so than ever in this era of social media, we're seeing it. Like, we're seeing it. And it's, it's scary. And it gives a lot of people, including myself, levels of anxiety to, to have to watch people go through these things. Daniel 12, verse 1 says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of the people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And so there's a time of trouble before Christ returns. First, uh, sorry, Second Timothy 3, verse 1 to, to 5 says, This also know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And it goes on to say that men, the state of humanity, men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient of parents, unthankful, unholy, and it goes on to say at the end, they're despisers of those that are good. And so here we have the problem. Here we have the state of the world, and the world is filled with war, evil, hatred, and sin. Sin is the disease of the world. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin are death. The outcome of sin is eventual death. And so thinking of Ukraine, we're seeing the realities of war. We're seeing the realities of the consequences of the current state of the world without hope, seemingly. And so as we look at this, these things, we have to ask, what if? What if there's purpose in this pain? Sometimes God's preparation comes with pain. Could it be that at the times and the things that we fear the most, that God might be using those times to develop us, to mold us, to refine us for bigger and better things, to learn to trust him. For God's purpose is more powerful than pain. And so the answer for what all of this prophecy that we've looked at tonight means for us is that there is hope. We look at Ukraine, we go, this is unbelievable, but there's hope. In the darkness, there is light, and it's laid out in the Bible, speaking of our coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. But to, to get to that point, to get to that hope, there are going to be hard times. We're going to go through hard times, and the world will go through political shifts and changes that aren't easy to see, a refining process which will lead to an eventual end of sin and death. And 1 Peter, verse one, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 7 says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perisheth, though it is tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revealing of Jesus Christ. So there is purpose in pain to learn, to grow, and to come out of our trials with a faith that is proven to be stronger. But we mentioned there is a hope, and there are some amazing verses to describe this hope when Jesus returns, and I'm just going to read through some of these. He shall judge between the nations. He shall decide disputes for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. We're talking about a peaceful ending result. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Beautiful, beautiful healing verses. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame man will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams. And this is a hope that we can all look forward to. We can all be a part of. Revelation 21, verse 3 to 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear will be wiped away from their eyes. And that is a time that we can look forward to. There will be no longer mourning or crying or pain. Do we want to be a part of a wonderful time like this? Yes. Well, if so, and if Christ is returning, and we believe it to be soon, and we can confirm, not that we're necessarily, we don't want to use the term excited necessarily, because we're not excited to see what's going on. It's It's painful to watch, but we confirm our hope with these things. And it's a wake-up call to lift our heads, to remember Christ is coming back. It might still be a while, but he will come back. And so we should live each day as if Christ is coming to gather those faithful, those who love him, and demonstrate his love for others. And the evidence of Bible prophecy being fulfilled, as we have seen tonight, should be that reminder to us that pain and suffering, although so awful and so hard to watch, can and will come to an end with the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, the words of Christ say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come. Revelation 22 verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. He brings a reward to repay each man according to his work. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse, sorry, 5 and verse 1 to 2 says, Now of the times and the seasons, brethren, we do not need to write you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And a thief in the night comes as a surprise. That's the point of the analogy. We don't want to be caught by surprise, for we are not of the night. We are of the day. We are looking for the day. We are looking for the light. We are looking for a way out of the pain. And so the burning question we have now is how long? How long until the return of Christ? We may not know the day or the hour. But having now witnessed the events that we continue to see unfold. It should be a reminder. It should be a wake-up call. And we should think of other prophecies that have come to pass and continue to believe that it could be any time now. It may not be this week. It may not be this month or even this decade. But it is certainly closer now than ever before. Every day we wake up is one day closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't know exactly how this crisis in Ukraine will continue to unfold. But one thing is for sure. Daniel 4 verse 17 says that the most high rules in the kingdom of men the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth 
and God's kingdom will be established upon it. And eventually, as Habakkuk 2 verse 14 says, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everybody will know of God and will be following his ways. And so the real question that we need to ask is what are we doing with our time? What are we doing with the time that we have left before he comes? For when Christ returns, we are told that he comes to judge the nations, to gather those who have been faithful to him. And may we take the days and weeks ahead to recommit ourselves, to fill our minds with his word, to draw closer to his word, to pray for the people of Ukraine, that they may have their suffering come to an end, that they might also come to an understanding of God's word. Pray for our brethren and sisters who are there. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up a crown of righteousness for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And Paul's writing this as he's just before his death. And he's thinking of that beautiful time of the kingdom, and he's thinking of those verses that we read. And not to me only will this crown be given, this reward, this time of peace, this time of tears being dried and pain being taken away, but it will also be given unto all them that love his appearing. And that phrase, love his appearing, carries weight. We need to learn to love his appearing, not to be scared And if we are scared, we have to ask ourselves those hard questions. So may we be the ones that love and seek with anticipation his appearing. Thank you.